I'd invite all of you to open your Bibles to the book of Job. And I know that during these lessons we've been looking at scenes and themes from the Gospels, but you'll see, I think, at the end of this lesson why we're ending uh, with looking at the life of Job and some things that we can learn from him. Uh, but I just want to say it's been uh, such a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, the conversations, the, the enriching atmosphere that I've been able to experience with you guys during the last few days has left me very encouraged, um, and the drive has not been bad at all. It's less than an hour to get back home, and so that's been a convenient part of all this as well. But thank you guys for your kindness, uh, for the encouragement, for being able to share in these things together. One of the things that I've always treasured since becoming a Christian is meeting more of my Christian family. And so thank you for being my brothers and sisters and mothers. Um, God has blessed us with, with such a good family uh, to encourage one another, to lift one another up. And uh, tonight, as we consider some things in Job, we'll see that one of the things Job didn't always have was a lot of friends, or at least good ones. Whenever you've had difficulties in your life, if you're like me, one of the things that comes easy and natural is prayer. Uh, prayer is something that, that when you're going through something difficult, the difficulties remind you that you have to rely on something outside of yourself and it drives you to prayer. But the Bible would teach that there's something in addition to prayer that, that for me can be more easily neglected in the midst of something very difficult. I want to show you what one of those things would be. In James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, and by the way, a few verses after this, he says, if anyone's suffering, let him pray. But a few, a few verses before that, he says this in addition. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. As you look at that passage, ask yourself this question. Have you obeyed what this is telling you to do? That in the midst of some kind of trial and some kind of difficulty, that you go back and look at the steadfastness of somebody like Job. You look at the patience of people like the prophets, the kinds of things that Hosea went through, that Jeremiah went through. And he says that these people are examples of steadfastness. What is steadfastness? The mental image I've had of steadfastness is the Greek god Atlas who's holding up the world and he better not drop the ball. If he drops the ball, then we're all dead. The idea of being steadfast means that you're bearing up under much weight and difficulty without justifying sin. And that's, by the way, how you know that you've lost your steadfastness or your patience is that you get to a point where you say, this difficulty is so bad that it's okay for me to be committing this sin for some momentary relief. What James is saying, and let's, let's, let me just say it this way, that when you're going through something difficult, yes, pray, but also engage in deep Bible study. You're going through something difficult? Go dive into the book of Hosea. Go dive into the book of Jeremiah. What we're going to do tonight is look at Job's example and see if this is an example that will help us not drop the ball and keep doing what it is that the Lord expects us to go through without justifying momentary pleasure. Now, as the book of Job opens up, uh, Job starts out by telling us about his character. He's a man from the land of Uz. It's not, he's not an Israelite, and there's debates about when all of these events took place. But he's from a non-Israelite location. But here's a man who fears God and turns away from evil. He, he eschews evil, as the King Jameth says. Um, have you ever noticed how the wisdom books talk to each other? Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon... What does the book of Proverbs tell us about somebody who fears God? It's the beginning of wisdom. So here's a man who has a deep respect for God. He's somebody who's a wise person according to the book of Proverbs. And this man also has a lot of wealth, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. If he had an Instagram account and he was showing everybody like the selfies of all of his animals and pictures of all the things that he had, he would have the farm that everybody would envy. So he's got the character, he's got wealth, 
He's also got a, a wonderful family, seven sons, three daughters, making the number 10 in total, one of the numbers of completion in the Bible. And so he's got this great family. We'll see in a little bit that these kids all get along really well with each other even. And that's something that parents really care about with their kids, that they're not at each other's throats all the time. Here's a family that loves each other. They get along well. And all of this sets us up to understand that everything that's about to happen to him make him the perfect candidate to help us consider our steadfastness. Look at Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Now, one of the things to note about Job chapter 1 is it toggles between things that are happening on earth, things that are happening in the spiritual realm. So the beginning of the book tells us about Job's life on earth, and then we get transported into this spiritual realm where God is pictured as this, this heavenly king that's got this council around him. And there's different times in the Bible that we get this picture of God having this kind of heavenly counsel. But here in this text, Satan comes up and God initiates this conversation with Satan. Hey, uh, where have you been going? I've been going all over the place. Okay, in, in all of the examination you've been doing of people on earth, did you consider my servant Job? You saw a lot of people that were probably corrupt, a lot of people that you already owned. Did you notice something about this man named Job? And notice that in the heavenly realm, God, apparently, at least here, will bring up godly people to Satan and say, what do you think about this guy? And Satan agrees, yeah, that Job does fear God, he does serve God, but the reason that Job does this is because God gives him a bunch of goodies. Well, you know, God... The only reason that he thinks you're worthy of being served is look at, look at his life. Look at all the wealth that he has. Look at all his family. If all of this was stripped away from, from, you, from him, he would surely curse you to your face. And by the way, what does it mean to curse God to his face? To renounce him, I think, is the idea. To say, I'm done with him. I'm shaking my fist at him. I don't want any kind of relationship with him anymore. The question in the book of Job is, would you serve God for nothing? If everything that you held dear in your life just crumbled before you, would you still see God as worthy of being served? And maybe let's take this language hyper-literally. Would you serve God for nothing? If you knew that you were going to go to hell, and in some theoretical universe, it was just bound and determined, there was nothing that was going to change it, you were going to go to hell. Would you still think that it was worthy to serve God? Would you still at least see that it's the right thing to do? And this is the accusation. This is the way that Satan is slandering in this text. He's slandering man to God when he talks to him here. The only reason anybody would ever want to serve you, God, is because of the goodies. Not because they see you as a treasure in and of yourself. Well, look at verse 12. In Job chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says... And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So here's God allowing Satan to mess up Job's life. And I like how the book begins. Because it tells us at the beginning that Job had this great character. And one of the things that I've struggled to assume at times in my life is if something bad happens in my life, it's certainly because of a bad decision I've made. It's certainly because of some mistake that I've made. And by the way, remember how Job talks with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes? Is it true that sometimes difficulties in your life come about because you just made a really bad decision? Absolutely, that's true. Is that always true, though? It is not always true. Now, I, I'm not the kind of preacher that always wants everything to start with the same letter. But when it works, it works, and it works in the book of Job. 
There are four things that begin with the letter F that Satan in one way or another disrupts in his life. And and we're going to see the verdict at the end of this. But look at the the four things that Satan affects in in Job's life. And before I, I start with the first one, I have a hard time imagining any kind of suffering people go through that that is outside of one of these four things. If you know somebody that's going through something difficult, my guess is it would be under one of these categories. And so Job is going through very comprehensive kinds of suffering. The first one are his finances. Look at Job chapter 1 and look at verses 13 through 17. Remember when we said earlier that it goes between things on earth, things in the heavenly realm? Now we go back to earth. Look at verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And uh, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep, and the servants have consumed and the serv- and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Just one messenger after another. And in this one, you go between a group of people that disrupted something to some kind of act of God, some kind of natural disaster, and then you go back to another group of people that disrupted more things here. Can you imagine in one moment, finding out that your 401k was just completely liquidated, that your, all of your Roth IRAs, all of the money that you had, just boom, completely gone in an instant. Job's wealth would have been bound up as, in his animals. Uh, when you shear the sheep, that's payday. The, all the animals that you have that can produce milk and that you're selling this sort of thing to other people. And here he finds out that all of his animals are gone. Uh, I remember when the 2008 stock market crash happened. And uh, when all of that was happening, I remember in my family, everybody was really worried about a lot of things. Everybody was losing lots of money. Do you remember the news reports about people who worked on Wall Street? And some of them uh, hung themselves. They killed themselves in their apartments. The ones that lived and worked on Wall Street and everything that, that meant everything to them, their life was bound up in all of that. If you lost everything, would you still serve God financially? Have you ever known a family that was like a whack-a-mole family? You ever played the game whack-a-mole where you whack one mole? And that, it's a creative name for the game because you have to whack a mole. And so um, another mole will come up, and then you have to whack another one. And then you, as soon as you think that you've whacked the mole, then another one, and it keeps. There's some families where it seems like, and it has nothing to do with the bad decisions they make. Boom, there's this, there's this disease that they get. And then this happens to them, and then that happens to them. When I was in San Diego, there was a family at the church that was like that. And It was like every week I'd get together with the husband and wife, and it was always something new. And and one week we got together, and they said, somebody stole all of our debit card, not credit card, all of our debit card information, and all of our money is gone. You realize how easily something like that could happen? And maybe it's not something like that. Do you remember in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 7, there are people that are sealed, but they end up dying. People that are sealed by God, the 144,000 that are sealed, they're spiritually protected, but they physically die in Revelation 14. But then in Revelation 13, there are people who have the mark of the beast, which might protect them physically because they can buy, sell, and trade, but it's going to kill them spiritually. In this country, if it came to you having to bow the knee to certain cultural ideologies and things that are being pushed in your workplace, would you ever be willing to stand up for the truth knowing that it might cause you to lose some of your finances? Would you ever do that kind of thing for the Lord? Notice the next thing that begins with the letter F is family. And this can be subdivided into two different ways. First, with his children. Look at Job chapter 1. Verses 18 and 19. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. 
And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And notice very carefully what the messenger says. And it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Did you notice that the text does not say that Job's children died? Have you ever noticed that? It does not. Have you ever had a time before? And by the way, I think they died. But have you ever had a time where you had to break really difficult news to somebody and you couldn't just bluntly say what it was, but you had to veil your language and you go, okay, they know what I'm talking about. Here the messenger comes and he says, all of your children were together because they always got along with each other. It seemed, look at this great relationship that they have and this tornado or something like this came upon them and it it fell upon them and, and it killed the young people is what he says. And Job, you know exactly what that means. I have to veil the language because it's so terrible to have to tell you what happened here. Um, When Samantha and I first moved to Nashville, there was a member of the church at Brentwood named Sean Kaplinger. He's 36 years old at the time. And and if if you just heard a story about a 36-year-old who had AIDS, would you start making all kinds of assumptions about, well, what were you doing that got you AIDS? Uh, not all suffering is because you made a mistake. Born with hemophilia, and at age eight was given a blood transfusion, and the blood donor had AIDS. Through no fault of his own. Samantha and I move here, and he's in hospice care, and brethren from the Brentwood Church were going to the hospice place and singing hymns with him, and in that time I'm meeting Sean's father, Jim. And after Sean passes away, Jim wants to start getting together with me every week. And his concern is that this makes me all the more want to be with God one day. Can you, if you lost a child, would you still serve God? Or would you look at it as some reason as, God, why did you let me down in this way? Between our two oldest, Asher and Abigail, Samantha had a miscarriage in San Diego. And uh, it was on a Sunday morning when I was already planning and the sermon was done. It was ready to go. And on Sunday morning, I was going to be preaching on Elijah raising the widow's son. And that morning at 4 a.m., she had a miscarriage in our living room. That's hard enough when it's a kid that you've, you've never met and developed that kind of connection with. That's difficult. Can you imagine losing 10 children at one time who love each other? Would you still serve God? Look at what happens with the spouse, though. Skip over for a moment, and then we're going to work our way back from this text. But look at Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 11. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I think for a long time, I had a misunderstanding of Mrs. Job. Uh, I, I don't have a great view of Mrs. Job, but I think it's a little bit different than what I used to think. When she says, curse God and die, obviously, she's suffering too. She, her money's gone. Her children are dead. And when she says to Job, curse God and die, why are you still holding on to the Lord? I think she's calling for a mercy killing. Look, Job, we've lost everything. I might be next. You're suffering right now. Just tell God you're done with him. He'll send a bolt of lightning and you'll be dead and your suffering will be over, Job. I think this is more of a mercy killing. Now, she's misguided. It's misguided compassion. But do you remember what Satan said back in Job chapter 1? Take all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. And guess who's become the voice of the serpent now? She is breathing out the very thing to Job that Satan wants Job to do. Curse him, curse him. She's become the voice of the serpent in this story. And when Job hears this, what he says is, you speak as a foolish woman. If God has given us good things, we rejoice. If he takes those things away, that's his prerogative too. I don't know if there's anybody here that every time you get in your car and to, to come to be with God's people and you can see in your rearview mirror some family member that's looking out the window, spouse maybe, 
and just frustrated that you just have to go keep doing this thing with all these weird cult people and this sort of thing. Over time, would that wear you down? So that you'd say, you know what, I'm just, I would just rather have a really peaceful marriage and not drag this problem into it anymore. If you're single, in my vast years of experience, the biggest reason that I've seen young people fall away is out of pursuit for a spouse. You find that there's, there's no brothers or sisters that are compatible with you in this local church or that local church. And, and, and in your desire to marry somebody, you start lowering your standards more and more and more. And then you end up with somebody that's not going to be good for you spiritually. If you're single, would you stay single a little bit longer if it would help your soul? Job's family disrupted. Notice the next one is Job's flesh. Go back just a few verses and look at Job chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Job chapter 2, verse 4 through verse 8. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. You know, up to this point, somebody might have told Job, well, you lost your money, but you still have your family. Okay, you don't have that anymore either. At least you still have your health, and now he doesn't have his health either. And when Satan is given permission to do whatever he wants to Job's body, whatever he wants to do, he gives him boils. Do you suppose that those were like really, 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 really bad? If he's got free range? Satan's theory here is that, okay, you can disrupt somebody's life, But as soon as I start affecting somebody's health, that's when people are going to get really crazy. Um, Do you think Satan knows by experience that you can take away somebody's wealth, you can take away their family, and they might still maintain their integrity? But how about this, if I can say it this way? If I can even just threaten somebody's health, they will lose their mind. And they will not serve God like they ought to anymore. Just the threat of it. You think Satan knows that by experience? There's a lot of modern books that have been written that um, I mentioned on Tuesday night. How since becoming a Christian, I've tried to, I, I love reading books. And I love trying to see things that I didn't see before and all that sort of thing. And there's different trends that are written in denominational circles where for a couple years it'll be this trend and then a couple years it'll be that. So a few years ago, one of the trends that that a lot of people were writing about were about how to have a a physically healthy body by unlocking these things in the Bible. So there's the Daniel fast and there's the body built by God. And if you do all these little things that you can see in the Bible, then you can be really, really healthy. And there, nobody has yet written the John the Baptist diet book. There's a lot of money left on the table. The locust and the wild honey, um, that you should try that, make it into a cereal or something. Uh, but the, the problem with books like this, if you follow these codes in the Bible, then you'll be really... How about Job? Fears God, turns away from evil, and look what happens with his health. If your health was threatened or something was happening with your health, would you say, you know what? I just don't think we should do what God says anymore. And in those cases, Satan might be winning. Notice the next one. Job's friends. Look at Job chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. Uh, I take it that these friends ordinarily were good friends. How many of you just love going to the hospital and seeing somebody sick? I mean, I don't, and especially with maybe some of the ways people would believe uh, what they would maybe believe about God. If, if we get too close to Job, we might be in the blast radius and there might be a big lightning bolt that hits Job next. And even with those kinds of views that maybe people in this time period had, they still draw near to Job. 
initially to sympathize with him and show him comfort. These are good friends. And in Job chapter 16, look at the summary that Job gives of his friends who keep telling him over and over and over again, the only reason you'd be going through this, Job, is because you've done something wrong, so just confess what it is. And by the way, as a quick side point, one of the impressive things about Job is that Job didn't let what everybody else was saying about him to define who he was. Isn't that oftentimes how we define ourselves? Well, you're this way, or you're this way, or you're that way. And maybe sometimes those kind of conversations can be enlightening and helpful. I'm not saying that that wouldn't be the case. But if you know that something is not true about you, and everybody else is saying the same thing, can you imagine being surrounded by three people, and they're they're saying, sinner, 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 you did something. And the whole time, he holds fast his integrity, and he knows that he didn't do anything that brought this on. Look at Job 16, 1 and 2. Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. There you go. You guys just stink. Um, When I was newly converted, I had a really good friend. We were really good friends from about eighth grade on until I hit my senior year of high school. And my mom and dad would always get to know my friends pretty well. And there was one time when he slept over, and I had been a Christian maybe for five or six months or something like that. And he slept over, and I had to go to work, and it was not uncommon in our household for my friends to just kind of stay around and hang out with my mom and dad. I got to go to work. We all know each other sort of thing. And so after I went to work, my friend just stopped talking to me. And I didn't know what was going on. So I went to my mom, and I said, do you know what's going on with Brian? And she said, oh, yeah, I know exactly what's going on with him. When you left, I told him that you joined a cult, and I told him to stop talking with you. And to this day, he won't. You know how hard it can be to lose a friend that you thought you had some kind of a loyalty with? It's it's maybe easier to go through that when it's not a Christian. But what about when it's a Christian? You ever had people let you down? You ever had a time before where you were going through something difficult and they kept saying, well, you must have made a bad choice. You must have made a bad choice. And you got to be honest if you did or not. But if you know you didn't, you you know how discouraging that can be. There's a lot of people that will shake their fist at God and say, God, I'm done with you because of those religious hypocrites and those people that let me down. And remember that people of faith look past the crowd. And they see the treasure of Christ. If somebody in this room or somebody at some other church in Nashville has ever let you down, would you ever use that as an excuse to curse God and say, I'm I'm just done with this whole thing? What's the verdict in the book? Go to Job chapter 42. At the end of the book, God comes in a whirlwind and he takes Job on a trip to the zoo. And he shows Job Leviathan and he shows him like the ostrich. And what's the lesson of the ostrich? What a dumb bird that thing is. And the ostrich doesn't even take care of its young, but somehow God still lets the young continue to live. It's almost like if you look at creation, God's got this. He knows what he's doing. Throughout the book, one of the mistakes that Job makes is he never curses God. He never renounces God. But there are times where he challenges him and and questions God in some ways that went too far. And this trip to the zoo shows Job that there's desert areas where God will send rain and take care of the plants in those areas. He's got this giant, these giant animals that he's created that God has tamed and God's in control. If you look around, Job, you'll know that you don't have the right to question me in these kinds of ways. And look what happens in Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. Very critical verses for this book. I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. When does he repent in the book of questioning God? Not of cursing God, but of questioning God. When when does he repent? Uh, Does it say he repents in all of the stuff that he has doubled back to him? Doesn't say that. It says he repents in dust and And ashes. Do you remember the question at the beginning of the book? Would you serve God for nothing? 
If everything was taken away from you, would you still see God as worthy of being served? Would you still have a humble attitude before him and in dust and ashes, he repents? Before he receives anything else back, he repents in that state. And so the question is, could Satan be correct regarding you, though? If Satan brought your name before God and said, if I can take away things from that person's life, then they'll curse. Okay, that didn't work. And by the way, d- let me just go ahead and say this. Do you think that there's going to be, after the precedents that were set the last couple of years, do you think that there's going to be another some sort of pandemic? And we're going to be urged to not, to not meet. We're going to be urged to not serve God in the ways that he has clearly said in the scriptures. And our, our health will be threatened. Are you ready for that? What are you going to do? Are you going to do what God says? Notice one other thing. In in James chapter 5, when James chapter 5 talked about you've seen the mercy of the Lord. How do you see the mercy of the Lord in the book of Job? Because when I first read the book of Job, I'll tell you that the thing that screamed off the page to me was not God's mercy. But James chapter 5, the text we began with, is telling us to go back to the book of Job and see God's mercy in it. How do we see God's mercy in this book? I think one thing, if James ends by talking about steadfastness, it also begins by talking about the same thing. In James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it talks about the testing of your faith producing steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Was Job's character strengthened through the book? If you track the things that Job says... There are, there are times that he questions God too much, and then there's times where he kind of reaches a new plateau that he doesn't seem to go back on. Uh, since I'm in my mid-30s now, some people have told me that if I don't start lifting weights, that my body will just start to atrophy. So I know it's probably been really obvious to you guys this week that I've started lifting weights a little bit, but I just have to use this as an illustration. Um, so why are you guys laughing about that? That's, that hurts my feeling. Um, when you're lifting weights and you're doing reps, you okay, I'm at seven, eight, nine. The sensation you get when you're lifting weights is you feel like you're getting weaker. You, you, I can't do it anymore. I feel like I've gotten weaker through this process. I don't feel like I'm getting stronger through this process. I can't lift it again. Do you know what's happening? If you remain steadfast, if you keep holding the ball, if you keep persisting in these workouts, the sensation of getting weak is leading to you being stronger if you remain steadfast. I don't know if anybody's here tonight and you feel like your faith has just been tested and tested and tested and I feel like I'm getting weaker and weaker and weaker, but you're not if you remain steadfast. And Job, through everything he went through, gets to a place where he's stronger and you just read through the book and you see his speeches and you see how he gets stronger throughout the book. Through the suffering, his growth was turbocharged. But one other thing that we see with the mercy of God, God uses this to let him grow. But notice the last thing, he was blessed in his latter days. Look at Job 42, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Job was blessed in his latter days. And I don't know that the takeaway for us would be that, oh, you're going through something really difficult in this life. And just around the corner, there's going to be some days in your future that are going to have a great turnaround. And maybe that will happen, but we're not promised that. Can you tell yourself in the midst of difficulties that that for you in an ultimate way, there's a Job 42, there's a Job 42, there's a Job 42, and everything ultimately is going to be okay because I'm going to be blessed in the latter days. Now, did you notice that all the animals are, are doubled in this passage? Double the sheep, double the camels. But what's not doubled in verse 13? His children. And maybe this is a small picture into the afterlife that Job doesn't have a great picture of in this book. 
But the animals, the first set of animals that he loses, are they gone forever? Yeah, they're gone. The first 10 kids that he loses, are they gone forever? They're not gone forever. God does double his children. Now he's got 20. And in this ultimate place in his latter days, he's going to be reunited with all of these kids one day. And maybe this is a dim picture in the book of Job to seeing the afterlife. Now, ultimately, Job looks forward to Christ who had nothing for finances. He had nowhere to lay his head at night. His family thought that he was out of his mind. His flesh was torn open on the cross, and his friends forsook him in his most trying moment. And I believe that somehow, some way, through the eyes of faith, Job believed that some kind of vindication was going to come for him. And I know that there's a lot of debates and questions about what exactly he means here. But at least ultimately, this complaint or this cry of Job is fulfilled in the one that would be like him, where he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will take his stand upon the earth. Final question. Did Job, in the book of Job, know more about God than you sitting here right now in the New Covenant? Job had a dim, a narrower understanding of God. He didn't have the full revelation of God. And the dimmer understanding that he had of God, he never cursed him no matter what he lost in his life. He still saw that God was worthy of being praised, that God was worthy of being worshipped. But will we, who have a wider picture of who God is, Serve him no matter what. We've been looking at scenes and themes from Jesus in the Gospels. We got pictures of Jesus in the Gospels that Job would have dreamed to be able to see. And will we, who have the full revelation of God, serve God no matter what happens? Like like Mary said on on Monday night, let it be to me according to your word. Let come what may, I will serve you, I will serve you if it leads to my death, because you are worthy of it. Thank you so much for your good attention, for these times that we could share together. I don't have any discussion questions tonight either. I didn't think that we'd have enough time, and we really don't anyways. But thank you again so much for inviting me to be part of this with all of you. It's been very enriching and encouraging for me to share in this with you guys. And um, so I think somebody's going to have a prayer and some announcements.